Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, Double CCIE, and creator of the Route Complete video course. And in this video, you're going to learn how we can have multiple virtual router instances running on a single physical router. Stay tuned. Have you ever used some sort of virtualization software? Maybe you've run VMware, you've got multiple virtualized servers running on a single physical server. Well, that's a great way to save resources by eliminating the need for extra physical servers. Well, really similar to how we can virtualize multiple servers on a single physical server, check this out. We can virtualize multiple routers on a single physical router. Now each of these virtual routers can have their own independent IP routing table and are logically isolated from the other virtual routers that are residing inside of that same physical router. This can offer a solution to service providers as an example. The service provider might want to keep their customer's network traffic separated. Maybe they want to have the IP routing tables of their different customers logically separate so they're not seeing one another's routes. Or maybe in a large enterprise, maybe we've got this design requirement to segregate different applications. Maybe we want to segregate voice and video and data. That's what we're going to be doing in this example. Now, one solution that Cisco offers that makes all this possible is something called VRF Lite. Now, some of the Cisco literature defines VRF as VPN routing slash forwarding because it's commonly used in VPN environments. But you're going to run into other literature out there from Cisco that defines VRF as virtual routing and forwarding, which is the definition that I typically use. Now, by the way, each virtualized router is referred to as a VRF. So a single physical router could be hosting multiple VRFs. And while it's great that a single physical router can be running multiple virtual router instances, the question comes up, how does the physical router keep traffic from the virtualized routers separate when sending data to a neighboring switcher router? Well, the solution is actually pretty simple. And similar to the old router on a stick approach of having a router interface configured as an IEEE 802.1Q trunk interface with different sub interfaces for each VLAN. And also, even though it's beyond the scope of this introductory video, I want you to be aware that VRF Lite can be configured to leak, as it's called, one or more routes between different router instances. Now, to demonstrate a basic VRF Lite configuration, first consider the topology shown here on screen. VRF Lite is configured on the common router, and the Fast Ethernet 0 0 interface on the common router has three sub interfaces one to carry traffic for each of the three VRFs. The VRFs are going to be named Voice, Data, and Video. And traffic from these three VRFs flow over a .1Q trunk to switch SW1, which then sends traffic out to the appropriate destination router based on VLAN membership. Specifically, the Voice VRF, it's going to use VLAN 2. The Data VRF, it's going to use VLAN 3. The Video VRF, it's going to use VLAN 4. And I want to show you the three steps to set up a basic VRF Lite configuration. Step number one, we want to globally define one or more VRFs. Here's how we do that on the common router. Let's go into global configuration mode and we simply say IP VRF and we give a name. I'm going to say IP VRF data as one of my VRFs. Let's exit from that. Give the command again. This time it's going to be IP VRF video. And now we'll do IP VRF voice. We've now created our three VRFs. Step number two is to assign an interface or a sub interface to these VRF instances. Let me show you the configuration that I have for these sub interfaces that I was telling you about. Notice for Fast Ethernet 0 slash 0, I've got these three sub interfaces. Fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 dot 2, dot 3, dot 4, and here are the VLAN assignments for these different sub interfaces. What we want to do is to go into sub interface configuration mode for each of these three sub interfaces and say, hey, you belong to this particular VRF. Let's do that by going into interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0 dot 2 to begin with. And I'll say IP VRF forwarding. And I'm going to give a VRF name and I'm going to say this one is for Voice. VLAN 2 is for the Voice VRF. Let's go into interface Fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 0.3 and we'll say IP VRF forwarding and this one's going to be data. 
Let's do it for Feisty Ethernet 0 slash 0 0.4. And this one's going to be for video. Now let's take another look at our configuration. Let's do a quick show run. Scroll down and see what we have. Notice that we did get those error messages because we're kicking in VRF. It got rid of the IP addresses on these subinterfaces. We need to go add those back. Let's do that real quick. We'll go into interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 0.2. And I'll say IP address. And it's 192.0.2.1. We've got a 30-bit subnet mask. So that's 255.255.255.252. Let's go into interface FHT Ethernet 0 slash 0 0.3. And we're still going to have a 30-bit subnet mask. And we're going to have an IP address of 198.51.100.1. Finally, interface FHT Ethernet 0 slash 0 0.4. Still have a 30-bit subnet mask, but let's change the IP address to 203.0.113.1. Great. Now let's take a look at our running config. Here we see the creation of those VRFs. Scroll down just a bit. And we see for each of our sub interfaces, we've got a VLAN assignment. We're being part of this dot one Q trunk. We've got our VRF assignment and we've got our IP address. Things are looking great. That was step two. Step three is we want to associate a routing process with each of these VRFs. Here's how we can do that. Let's go back into global configuration mode and I'm going to say router and I'll use OSPF router OSPF and I'll give a process ID of one and I'll say this is going to be associated with VRF voice and I want any interfaces in this VRF to participate. So I'm simply going to say network 0.0.0.0.255.255.255.255. That's a shortcut way of saying, hey, I want all the interfaces to participate. Again, this is only interfaces that are part of this VRF. And I'm going to say, you all belong to area zero. Let's do the same thing for the data VRF. The process ID, we'll say it's two. The VRF is data. Oh, by the way, did you notice this status update for process ID one? We just formed an OSPF adjacency. Fantastic. Now, let's add a similar command here. In fact, let's add an identical command here to say we want all of the data VRF interfaces participating in this OSPF process ID 2. We'll enter that. One more to go. We're going to say that we want to have OSPF process ID 3, and it's going to be associated with VRF video. Let's put a space in there. And I'll say I want all of the video VRF subinterfaces or interfaces to participate in area zero. Great. We've now configured VRF, specifically VRF light on this common router. Now let's do some verification. We can use the show IP VRF command to display the VRFs that I've created on this router. We have these three VRFs created. We could also say show IP route VRF. And I could give a VRF name here. For example, I could say voice. And it's going to show me the routing table for the voice VRF. And notice that we have learned one network via OSPF, network 10.1.1.0. And you can tell by looking at the topology, that is connected off of the voice router going to switch SW2. Excellent. We could do the same thing for the data VRF. It's learned about network 172.16.1.0. That's connecting the data router to switch SW3. And just for completion's sake, let's do the video VRF. And it's learned about the 192.168.1.0 network connecting the video router over to switch SW4. And we can also use a VRF specific ping to test connectivity with a remote IP address. For example, let's say that we're on the common router and we want to ping fast ethernet 0 slash 1 over on the voice router and that interface has an IP address of 10.1.1.1. How does the common router know it needs to reach the IP address using the voice VRF? Well, we can specify that as part of the ping command. I can say ping VRF voice, so it knows which VRF we're using. Then I give the IP address of 10.1.1.1, and it is successful. Well, we had one timeout. Let's try it again. That's better. It was successful. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and demonstration of VRF Lite fundamentals. 
This is something that's covered in Cisco's route training, one of the three courses making up the CCMP and routing and switching certification. In fact, I have a route complete video course. You can check it out at kwtrain.com slash route course. That's kwtrain.com slash route course. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn even more about Cisco routing and switching technologies, just click the link in the description or on the right side of the screen and I'll send you more training videos. And also, if you don't want to miss any of my YouTube videos, be sure and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.